Hello and welcome to lecture 19. In this lecture, we're just going to cover a single section, section 6.3, which is all about collisions, specifically head-on collisions. These are things crashing straight together. Okay, uh, One thing could be at rest, but still head-on, like direct collisions. It's just a single section, just a couple of ideas, but it turns out there's a lot of types of problems that can involve collisions. You know, so it's sort of a, a, a system that opens up and has a lot of options, even though it's just a, a real tight set of ideas. Okay, so our key terms um, are nice because they fit together really nicely. There's just three of them, all right? And they're all just different, the different types of collisions we're gonna talk about, because really there are three types of collisions. Okay, what are they? Type one is probably the most realistic, and it's a partially inelastic collision. Well, what does that mean? Okay, well, it's a collision where some energy is lost, and the objects do not stick together. So this is things crashing together where there's the objects get damaged because if there's any crumpling, if there's any sound during the collision, that means some of the energy must have been lost. It had to have changed from kinetic energy to some other form because sound requires energy, okay? So that's the most realistic, that's partially inelastic. You notice they do not stick together. On the other hand, we could have a perfectly inelastic collision where there's some energy lost and the objects do stick together. All right, so that's the perfect part, is that after the collision, the two objects that were separate are now one, all right? And when we talk about collisions, by the way, it's always two objects. Could we have a three-object collision? Yes. Do we have the mathematical to tools to solve it? No. Are we going to see collisions with more than two objects in this class? Absolutely not. Okay, every single collision is a two-object collision. Now, the only time we actually ever have three objects would be like in the previous lecture where we had the explosions and three pieces flying in three directions or the plate shattering example and three pieces flying in three different directions. That's just the only time we'd ever have three or more objects. Objects, But here in collisions, it's always two. Okay, number one, number three, always two. Okay, so final type of collision is elastic, right? This is a very ideal collision. It's no energy lost, okay? And since there's no energy lost, they're definitely not sticking together. This is like a perfect collision. This would be through two objects that are so perfectly rigid that when they hit to, when they hit together, there's no energy lost. No such thing actually exists. We can have approximations. Um, basically, like if you think like steel or something, or even billiard balls um, smashing together, there's very little energy loss. So we could say negligible energy loss. So we could treat it like an elastic collision. Okay. So anything that's very rigid might be a good approximation of elastic collision. And by the way, I do want to comment on this, this idea of the perfectly inelastic collision, because since they stick together, you might think, wait, does that mean all the energy is lost? No, they can still move afterwards. There's just a proportional amount of energy loss depending on their relative masses. And I'll show that in an example. All right, so let's get into the equations here. Okay, so on the one hand, there's almost nothing new. All right, we have a conservation momentum equation, which we saw in the previous section, because you know that was just for you know things like recoil of firing a gun or a cannon or something exploding or a spore, you know, um, or a spore being launched by a fungus, right? In that case, there was always going to be basically zero on one side, so the initial momentum always start off at zero. The final momentum is all we cared about. With a collision, the only difference is that now we can have momentum, non-zero momentum, on both sides of the equation. But otherwise, we've already seen this equation. And we've also um, kind of seen this idea of energy being conserved, maybe a little bit. But here, this is going to be really explicit that for those elastic collisions, the type 3, and only for those types of collisions, we also have conservation of kinetic energy. Okay, and we'll talk about why that actually makes elastic collisions inherently more complex and why we actually then go on and have these three equations that all only apply to elastic collisions. Equation one, two, and three. So it turns out that these, these three equations are actually derived from these two. Let me show you that. All right, oh, so first of all, that in all three types of collisions, despite you know, ones where energy is lost, momentum is conserved for all of them. Because that's the assumption we're making for collisions, that collisions occur so quickly that there's no external forces, thus momentum is conserved for all of our collisions. Okay, by definition, collisions are the perfect type of problem to highlight what momentum conservation is all about and why it's useful. Okay, and that's true. I mean, it's a pretty good, pretty good system for that because collisions happen fast, no external forces, okay? Negligible external forces. All right, so anyway, I'm pointing out that PA, this is, this is the idea that without the subscript, it's initial, right? And, this, and then when it has 
the, um, this little apostrophe, that's representing final. We, I haven't shown this notation before, but the reason that we use it here is because otherwise we have so many subscripts. And for the most part, it is better to just use an apostrophe for final. I mean, is that immediately obvious what the apostrophe means? No. But does it save space? Is it quicker to write? Yes. Right? So there's pros and cons. Okay? So do, do note that without the apostrophe, that's initial. And with the apostrophe, it's final. Okay? Furthermore, P initial equals P final for collisions of two objects when colliding head on. Okay? So that's, that's what we're saying here. That the momentum is always conserved. And this, the P initial and final here would be like the total momentum. This is showing the sum. The sum of the two objects, A and B. Okay? All right? And then looking over here, all three of these equations, as I said, they are derived from the momentum equation. And notice all I've done here is expand out the momentum equation. So I've just wrote PA as MAVA, PB as MVVB, and so on. Okay? Because each of these, by definition, P is MV, right? Right? That's the definition of momentum. P for momentum, M for mass, V for velocity. Momentum has units of newton seconds. Okay? All right? And then furthermore, the kinetic energy equation here, which is just all Ks, well, every kinetic energy term is one half mv squared. Okay, that's kinetic energy. We should definitely know that by now. If not, review it. Okay, and so that means that Ka, for example, is one half ma va squared. Okay, likewise for Kb, and then Ka prime, because I'll usually call that Ka prime because the apostrophe I read it as prime. Okay, that's what physicists do. Well, then that's going to be one half ma va prime squared. Okay, because VA prime represents the final velocity of object A, just as VA, VB prime represents the final velocity of object B. And we're squaring it because we're talking about energy. Okay? So when we do that, when we take these two big equations and we solve them for VA prime and VB prime, we get these. All right? This is just, this, just a bunch of algebra to get here. I'm actually not going to you know, do it. I'm not going to ask you to do it, but you can, um, you can do it. You can use, use the algebra to get to these expressions. Why would you want to get the, to these expressions? Because this is often what we're trying to look for. The final unknown velocity of object A. The final un unknown object of, of, excuse me, the final unknown velocity of object B. All right? Because we probably know what their initial velocities were, but we want to find out what they were after the collision. Now, this last equation is a weird one. What it is, is it, it replaces the energy equation. Okay? So what I mean by that is that if you go on and you use these expressions, which are derived from energy and momentum, and then put them back into energy, then you can actually end up simplifying energy into this expression, which is completely independent. It is, it is truly energy. And so that means what you can do is then if you want to use your two independent equations, your momentum and kinetic energy equations, okay? And when independent is a mathematical terms, term, it means that they're not redundant equations. You can actually use them to solve for unknowns. You can use this instead of that. And what's so ad advantageous is there's no squares here, right? They're gone. And it's just, just, it's just a mathematical convenience that you can use this instead, okay? And it really is much, I mean, it's, it's a pain in the butt to derive, but I'm giving it to you and saying that you can use that instead of this and save yourself a lot of trouble. But you have to be aware that it only works for head-on collisions. We cannot use it, for, use it for glancing collisions, which we'll discuss in the next lecture, the final lecture for chapter six. All right? So I'll remind you when we get there, but right, right away, that's a good, good thing to keep in mind. Okay? All right. So... Moving on, um, okay, so first of all, let's talk about the types of problems, and then we'll get into the examples, okay? So in the practice, we're gonna look at a f uh, quite a few examples, and even there's five types, which is you know kind of the upper limit of the number of types of problems that I ever put into the, these practice sections, okay? So what are they? Well, first of all, I'll, I'll mention that when I, it was my decision this semester to, you know, to split up problems, really kind of have this really clear path, being like, these are the types of problems you're going to see. And the, the impetus, the motivation for that was momentum. Because every time I lecture on momentum, every time I teach momentum, I think about how you can really categorize these problems into a few categories, a few types, okay? And indeed you can. So what are they? Okay? Type one, problems that involve head-on elastic collisions and solving for up to two unknown velocities and or quantities of transferred kinetic energy. Okay? Okay? So those are the elastic ones. Type two, Problems that involve head-on partially elastic collisions and solving for one, uh, one unknown velocity and or quantity of lost energy. Okay? 
So notice then that there's, there's fewer unknowns because you have fewer equations you're actually working with, okay? Type three, problems that involve head-on fully inelastic. And fully, by the way, is a, another way to express perfectly. So perfectly inelastic and fully inelastic are synonyms. I, I try to use one. I didn't actually notice I used fully instead of perfectly, but be aware they, be aware they are synonyms. Okay, it's when they stick together. So anyway, fully inelastic collisions and solving for one unknown velocity and or quantity of lost energy. Okay, so those are just the, just the big three where you're just gonna be focusing on a collision and it's either elastic, partially inelastic, or perfectly inelastic, okay? But then there's a, two other types of problems, fairly complex problems that involve fully inelastic collisions followed by a conservation of energy process. So there's two things crashing together, sticking together, and then sliding uphill, or falling off a table, or um, you know rolling across fric ground of friction, whatever it may be, right? So some, something that's gonna be an energy process that follows the momentum. Now we've already seen the combination of energy momentum in the cannon firing the cannonball example in the previous lecture. So that's, that's the type of problem we're going to see, except now it's a collision instead of a recoil. Okay. And then finally type five, complex problems that involve partially inelastic or elastic, fall, elastic collisions that is, followed by conserva conservation energy process. Okay. Why would, why would type five be more complex than type four? Because those types of collisions where the objects don't stick together means you have to, you have, you have to deal with more unknowns, potentially kind of deal with a more complex system. Okay. All right. Well, let's get to it. Example one, and, um, a, an elastic collision occurs between two balls of mass A of one kilogram, mass two or mass B of 4.2 kilograms. The collision involves the two balls traveling towards um, each other with initial speeds of 12.6 and negative 15.2. How much energy is transferred from ball A to ball ball? Or well, from ball B to ball A. Okay. Well, first of all, why do we even know that the energy is going that direction? Well, we don't until we solve for it. Okay. But the fact I'm asking for it probably implies it does, right? As opposed to energy being transferred from A to B, right? So that it's going from um, it's from B to A. Okay. So let's let's think about how we're going to do this. So we use the final velocity equation specifically for collisions like this. So what equations are those? Okay, well, here's the picture, first of all, right? So it's good to know what we're going on because it's a head-on collision. One's moving to the right, which I call the positive direction. One's moving to the left, which is the negative direction, which is why this one is specified as negative 15.2, okay? All right, these are, the these are the equations that I'm referring to, okay? Let me, just show Let me go ahead and show both of them, okay? So these are the exact same equations that show up right here, right? These, these are those, those equations, okay? The equations that are derived from momentum and energy that are specific for head-on elastic collisions, okay? Only for elastic, okay? So it's a nice thing is that these, these equations are pre-made. You don't have to drive them each time, okay? All right, and so then we just plug in all our numbers and we find that it's as simple as that. It really is plug and chug for both of them. There's no unknowns, there's no algebra, and we can just solve for the final um, velocity of A, so VA prime, and the final velocity of B. Notice that they're both negative. What does that mean? That means that they're both going the negative x direction after the collision. So in other words, VA gets bounced completely backwards and then VB continues moving in the direction it was moving at. But notice VB slows down significantly. It goes from 15 to five and VA actually speeds up. It gets, it gets really ricocheted back really fast. Well, why is that? Look at their masses, right? B is over four times as massive. So it's able to plow through A and send it flying back in the opposite direction it was moving in, okay? So that inertia has a big effect when we're talking about momentum, momentum and energy ideas in collisions like this, all right? But we were asked for energy. We needed these values to find energy, all right? But we weren't, you know, that was not what we were specifically asked for. We are asked for how much energy is transferred, okay? So first of all, looking at these numbers, we can already see that energy is transferred from B to A. Um, that's because if we look at it, A sped up and B slowed down, okay? All right, so um, we're gonna then find out that the energy transfer is just equal to the change in kinetic energy of A because if this value of change of kinetic energy is positive, then it must have come from ball A. There's no other source of energy in this situation. It's an isolated system, okay? So then I'm just gonna solve for the change in kinetic energy of A, which is as simple as that, all right? Just one half the mass times the, uh, the, the difference between the squares plug in the numbers, right? Of course, I needed to find this number. Um, you know, this was not given, but we already found it, the 20.8 that is, okay? The, neg the negatives won't matter because we're squaring everything, okay? The difference does matter. And there we go, 296 joules. That's how much energy B lost and how much energy get A gained, okay? And we know it came from B because there's nowhere else it could have come from.
All right. Okay, so good illustration of what's going on with an elastic collision and how you can consider energy in such a collision. All right, okay. So another example two is all about the same ideas, um, just a little bit more subtle, I would say. Let's look what's going on. So ball A has initial velocity 14 meters per second and undergoes an elastic collision with ball B that is initially at rest. Afterwards, the speed of ball B is 21 meters per second, okay? All right, notice the masses aren't given here. That makes the problem interesting right away. Not because I forgot to give them, but because we don't need them. Okay, not for what's being asked at least. What will be the speed of the ball if the initial speed of ball A is doubled? Okay, so then we, think, we need to think about what happens as we, as we double the speed. Okay, well, let's see. Let's use our equation. Okay, so we're going to start with the equation that, again, kind of is the way we'd start any elastic collision is we use this this expression, this derived expression that gives us the final velocity. In this case, V2F, notice that here I am using the subscript F instead of the prime notation, okay? And um, since V2 initial was zero, this whole second term just goes away, which means the final velocity of um, ball two is just going to be this, okay? All right, it's just gonna be two M1 over M1 plus M2 times V1 initial. But we don't know any of the Ms, okay? We just, we don't know what they are. But look at the relationship the relationship between V2 final and V1 initial. It is directly proportional, okay? So thus we see that V1 initial is directly proportional to V2 final. And therefore, if we double V1 initial, we have to also double V2 final. That's a direct proportionality. It doesn't matter what the masses are, all right? So if we double, if we double V, um, the initial one, if we double um, this initial velocity, because that was a question, what will be the speed of ball B if the initial speed of ball A is doubled? Well, you know, here before it was 14, and that resulted in 21, but if we double it, make it 28, then that's going to make that one 42. Okay? All right. So pretty straightforward because it's a direct proportionality, but setting it up and kind of thinking about where that comes from is subtle. All right. Well, B is doubly subtle. Even getting there is kind of confusing, you know, and then thinking abstractly is another level of confusion. But let me show you how it works. Okay. So in part B, what will be the speed of ball A if the mass of ball A is doubled? Okay. Um, so let me read that more carefully. What will be the speed of ball B if the mass of ball A is doubled? Okay. That's weird, right? We weren't even given the masses. Why are we being asked a question about them? Because we, we can consider their ratio. All right, so how do we do that? Okay, so we're gonna start with the same thing. I'm gonna go ahead and just leave off the term that we know is gonna be zero, because this term goes to zero because V2 initial is zero, okay? Uh, so we're just gonna start with this expression here, all right? And then what I'm gonna do, okay, and I think we're, we're the same starting place, is now I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna plug in the numbers right away. So I'm gonna plug in the final, the final velocity, 21, and the initial velocity, uh, 14, okay? All right, and again, we don't need the other initial velocity because it was zero. That's why we only have one final, one initial. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate something that I, I know I care about. I'm going to isolate algebraically m2 over m1. Because right now we don't have an m2 over m1, but we, we can as long as we do some fancy algebra. And the reason I want to do that is because then I can consider that ratio. Because here we're asked, what is, we're going to double a, okay? Well, or double the mass of a. Well, if I double the mass of a, that's going to change this ratio in a in a known mathematical way, as long as I have that ratio in my equation, okay? So what I do is I multiply both sides of the equation by one, okay? So I multiply the 21 by one. I also multiply the left side, the left side of the equation by one, but I express my one in a really tricky way as one over m1 over one over m1, all right? Because this is just one. So I'm allowed to multiply the equation by it because, you know, I multiply both sides by one. Okay, doesn't change anything. But when I distribute that one over M1 and one over M1, look what happens. I end up with a two in the numerator and I end up with a one plus M2 over M1 in the denominator. Ah, there we go. I have the fraction or the ratio that I wanted to isolate. Okay, and now I'm gonna solve for it. Okay, so then I just do some cross multiplication and then finally solve for M2 over M1 and it ends up being one third, okay? so. That is so cool because that tells me, even though I don't know their masses, I know that in order for this to be true, in order for ball A or one traveling at a velocity of 14 meters per second to crash into ball B or two that was at rest, and afterwards for ball B to be moving at 21 meters per second, the only way for that to be true, to get a 21 and the 14 from one of them being at rest, is for ball two, that is B, to be 
one third as massive as ball one. That's the only way. All right. So in other words, A was three times as big as B. We don't, you know, we don't know if it's one and three kilograms or two and six. It doesn't matter. But we do know that one is three times as massive as the other. Okay. So that means if we, if M1 is doubled, then our ratio would change to one six. We can then plug that ra ratio back into these numbers, but now leave V2 final instead of as a known value of 21 as an unknown value. And then we realize it becomes 24. So, so fascinating that we can actually get a numerical answer and find out that the final velocity has to be 24 instead of 21 by doubling A. And it's, it's just, it is such a great indication, a good way to start this material to show that you can't skip the algebra when it comes to conservation momentum problems like this. You really can't because the, there's no way to have like just kind of thought your way through that. You have to work it out and do the steps, okay? All right, I mean, I've been doing these for years and I have to work them out and do the steps because it is, it is not immediately apparent until you do it. You have, I mean, you can see it. It becomes clear. It's an emergent idea, but it is not one that you can just kind of, you know, just like think, oh, I'm just going to move some numbers around in my head. You have to write it down. Okay. All right. So moving on, we got more examples, more types, and some concept questions. So example three, we are finally moved on to partially inelastic collisions. Still head on, still one dimensional because head on and one dimensional are the same thing. All right. All right. Two balls rolling on a frictionless surface. The initial velocities prior to the collision are recorded as 0.28 and negative 2.28. So they're going opposite directions. We're given their masses, specifically 1.34 and 4.91. One is significantly bigger than the other. All right. You get the idea. And here's the thing. We're given one of their final velocities, negative 2.74. All right. And then we're asked to find the other final velocity. And then we're asked for how much energy is lost. So how would we go about doing this? Well, since this is a partially inelastic equation, we can't use those, those equ equations that we used in the last two examples. We can't use those, those prefabricated equations for finding the final velocity. We just can't. Those only work for elastic, okay? But we can use just the plain old conservation momentum equation. What does that look like? Okay, it looks like this, right? This one. This is the equation to start with, okay? Notice we did not start with this equation in the previous two examples because those were different types of collisions. So you have to pay attention to the type of collision. So important. Since this is a partially inelastic collision, we start with the momentum equation, okay? And it's not the final velocity equation, all right? So move on, plug in what we know, all right? Neither of them is at rest. Also, those are all non-zeros. And as we plug everything in, we see, realize there's only one unknown. So then we can just solve for that one unknown, all right? I went ahead and multiplied my numbers together and expressed them in terms of newton seconds. So for example, 1.34 times 0.28 is 0.375. Okay, and there's the appropriate units, okay, because a kilogram times a meter per second is a newton second. All right, plug everything in, and then final velocity is negative 1.46. So that means that after the collision, object B is moving in the negative direction at a speed of 1.46, okay? So it's the same sort of thing with it. This, this larger one plowed through and sent everything going backwards, okay? All right, and then we want to find how much energy is lost, okay? And we don't, we don't know that until we plug it into the kinetic energy equation, all right? So we're just going to find the initial kinetic energy, all right? Find out that it's 12.8, then do the same thing for final, right, for both objects, and it's 10.3, which means the difference is just 2.6. So 2.6 is the magnitude of energy that was lost, okay? You can think of it as negative, but since we were just asked for how much was lost, I express it here as just the magnitude, okay? That's it. That's what it comes down to. But notice, since it's partially inelastic, we started with a different equation, okay? All right? So let's do some concept questions, right? These are really good ones to see how, you, how much you're understanding the ideas and not just the math, okay? So concept question one. Determine whether each of the following graphs represents an inelastic collision between the objects A and B and consider the relative masses of objects A and B in each case, okay? So our first one, okay, question A, we've got a graph of position versus time. So we see we have two objects. So always the dotted line represents uh, object B and the solid line represents object A. Since it's linear, that means we have a constant velocity since it's position versus time. And then afterwards, well, we have no velocity because if we have an object, a position that isn't changing in time, that means that this is rest. So these are two objects that are actually smashed together and aren't even moving afterwards. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that VA, VA prime and VB prime, so the final velocities are zero. That means that all the energy is lost. And the only way that's, po that's possible is for a perfectly inelastic collision of equal masses. 
That is literally the only way you can pull that off. That's the only way for a collision to result in total loss of kinetic energy is for them to stick together and to have had equal masses ahead of time. And that's what we see in this graph and we can determine that, okay? All right, and we can compare it to the equations, okay? So on to B, in B, we see clearly that the velocities are not zero afterwards and the final velocity is less than zero. Less than zero means that it's closer to the initial velocity of B than it is to the initial velocity of A, okay? They are traveling as one after the collision, okay? So if they're traveling together after the collision, because notice here our, our axes are different, the vertical axis is velocity instead of position, and the, but the horizontal axis is still time. And so here they have a non-zero velocity, but they have the equal non-zero velocity, which means they must have stuck together. So that means that since they're traveling together, we know it's perfectly inelastic, just like in A. And we also know, based on the fact that the final velocity is closer to the initial velocity of B, that MB must be the more massive object, especially because we, we can see that its velocity was smaller, but yet the final velocity is closer to it. The only way for that to be true is for MB to be significantly larger than MA, okay? Because remember, momentum is conserved, not velocity, okay? So if, if, you can, if you can really understand this graph and this interpretation, then you're in good shape, okay? All right, so make sure, spend some time with it, have, find your own way to understand it, but this is, this is the result, okay? All right, finally in C, in C we have some, more, uh, some uh, symmetry again, just like in, uh, in A, all right? So here we have that VA prime equals negative VB prime, likewise VA equals negative VB. So we're initially, you know, they started with, the, with op, uh, opposite velocities in terms of direction, but same magnitude, and afterwards the same thing, they just swapped, see? So they just kind of swapped places, all right? Thus, they don't stick together. We know they don't stick together because afterwards they're moving at different velocities. They bounce off and kind of travel back in opposite way, uh, um, directions. They, they, this is like two objects smashing together, ricocheting, and then traveling back in opposite directions. That's clearly we can, what we see. But also we see that they don't travel back in opposite directions at the same speed. That means that there had to be some energy lost. So that means this is a partially inelastic collision. If it was an elastic collision, then the dotted line would go up here like this, and the solid line would go down like that, okay? But since it is symmetric, since the changes are exactly equal, we know the masses must be equal. All right? So pretty cool interpretation there. So much we can learn just by looking at this graph. Okay? Another concept question doesn't involve graphs, but also some interesting ideas. Consider a perfectly elastic collision in which a moving ball A strikes an, an initially stationary ball B. Under what circumstances will ball A come to rest? Okay? So not, not both of them coming to rest, because we know the only way for both of them to come to rest, come to rest is in a perfectly inelastic collision. And in question two, we're talking about a perfectly elastic collision, okay? And by the way, usually, usually an elastic collision is just called an elastic collision, and that word perfectly is left off, but I did leave it in there. So don't be confused. This is not a perfectly inelastic collision. This is a perfectly elastic collision. This is the type where all the energy is conserved. Whenever you see that word, elastic, you know no energy loss. So anyway, so what are the circumstances where one of them comes to rest? All right. Well, the only way for that to happen, if we look at the equation here, because this is because now we're go, since we're back to elastic, we're back to using the final velocity equation. Okay. Well, the only way for that to happen is for this um, numerator to become zero. Right. That's the only way. Right. Because because we know that v b is um, is zero. And thus, this whole second term is zero because VB initial, uh, represents the initial velocity of B, and B was stationary; it was at rest. So that's the second term has to be zero, which we've seen before. And so that means the only way for VA prime to be zero, which is A coming to rest, is for this numerator to be zero. Well, the only way for the numerator to be zero is for A to equal B in terms of mass. Okay, that's the only way, right? Because if MA equals MB, then we get a zero up top which means that VA prime, the final velocity of object A is zero, okay? So they have to have equal masses. It's the only way you can pull that off, all right? So and this is what's happening, right? One of them, one of them is in motion, one of, them, one of them is at rest, they're crashing together, think, think billiard balls, okay? So then under what circumstances will ball A recoil backwards? Okay, so we'll use the same thing, all right? And remember the second term will be zero because VB started at rest. Focus on the numerator of the first term. And the only way for VA prime to be less than zero is for MB to be greater than MA because that will give us a numerator that's less, that's less than zero, all right? That's negative, thus make, and since VA was positive, that will make VA prime negative, all right? So we can kind of just right away look at, look at our, our final velocity equation here, of course, derived from conservation of momentum and conservation of energy, and 
get some quick results, some quick interpretation. Okay. And finally, in C, under what circumstances will the maximum amount of energy be transferred from A to B? Okay. Well, let's look at our equation yet again, final time. Okay. And so, but here, look, look what I'm looking at. I'm not looking at the final velocity equation for A this time. I'm actually now looking at the final velocity equation for B. Okay. We have a term going to zero. Again, the term that goes to zero because B started from rest, but B is B's not going to stay at rest, right? So we want, if we want maximum energy transferred, the only way for that to happen is for MA to equal MB because then we have then that VB prime is just going to be VA. And if VB prime is equal to VA, that means that the final velocity of the, of the ball that was at rest is equal to the initial velocity of the, of the ball that was in motion. And if that's the case, then it stole all of its energy. But that makes sense because in part A, we already found that if they're equal masses, then A comes to rest. And if it comes to rest, where did this energy go? Well, since it's a perfectly elastic or elastic collision, the only place this energy could go is B. So we kind of already knew the result of C, but here we're confirming it. Okay? All right. So ball B acquires all the energy of ball A. So pretty cool how all these ideas fit together. I, I hope you appreciate it. All right. So let's do some more examples now. All right? Concept, concept out of the way. Kind of introductory ones. Now we're just going to get into a, just a kind of a, a, a series of increasingly complex examples. I'll try not to spend too much time on them because I do want to you know, get this lecture done and not have it go forever, but I do want to show you all of them. Okay? All right, so example four. Consider a perfectly inelastic collision between a bullet striking a large block of wood. The bullet is initially in motion. We're given its velocity, 450, and the block is initially at rest. If the masses of the, um, the wood and the block are 6.5 and 35 grams, right? So this is tiny compared to the 6.5 kilograms. Um, then what is the final velocity of the block and bullet? All right, and that's the block with embedded bullet, so I say bullet inside it. And then what is the ratio of the final kinetic energies over initial kinetic energies? And C, what is the fraction of kinetic energy lost during the collision? All right, so this is a inelastic. They're going to stick together and move as one afterwards. All right, so for momentum, we got this result right here. All right, so that's going to allow me to solve um, for VB. Okay, this is just an expression that came straight from the momentum equation. And I have a zero because the block started from rest. All right, so then I can just solve for the final velocity of the bullet. All right, VB just represents um, final velocity. All right, and actually this isn't the bullet. I, I, this is the final velocity of the block with embedded bullet. Okay, um, so lowercase b stands for the mass of the bullet. B, uppercase b, just stands for the final velocity. That's the way I'm using my subscripts here. A doesn't stand, there's no object that starts with A, right? A just stands for the initial velocity. W stands for wood. Okay, and I use d lowercase for the object subscripts and then uppercase for the, um, the event subscripts. So A comes first, B comes second. All right, so anyway, so VA is just the velocity of the bullet. It was the only velocity that the system started with. Plug everything in and we find that the block with embedded bullet is moving at a rate of 2.41 meters per second after the collision. All right, after the perfectly inelastic collision. All right, so in part B, this is where we're just gonna find the ratio. All right, so here I'm gonna use um, the energy this is the initial energy of the system, and this is the final energy of the system. Okay, so I want the ratio of k final over k initial. So I'm gonna plug everything in, all right? I'm gonna make a substitution because I know that VB can be expressed in terms of VA. Um, the reason I would do that is because, check it out, now I have a VA up top and a VA down, down uh, in the denominator, and they're both squared if I distribute the squared, which means they're gonna cancel, right? It's here, we see, they're canceling, all right? And the great thing about them canceling is then I have an expression for the ratio of final energy to initial energy that is dependent on the masses only. It doesn't matter how fast the bullet's going. It literally doesn't matter. The only thing that will affect the, the, the ratio of energy is the relative masses, the mass of the bullet compared to the mass of the wood. All right, and since the bullet is so tiny compared to the mass of the wood, and this is the mass of the wood with bullet, right? But might as, we might as well just round the mass of the wood because you can see it's almost past the significant figures, the effect, the, the effect of the added mass of the embedded bullet. But once you take that ratio, we find that the, the ratio of kinetic um, energy that remains compared to the initial kinetic energy is 0 0.005. All right, so it's tiny. It's about half of 1% of the energy remains afterwards. The, what happened to the rest of it? It went into the actual the energy it took for the bullet to get embedded. I mean, think that was a lot, that's a lot of heat energy for the bullet to actually push all the wood out of the way. Plus, I mean, the compress, compressive energy of the wood, right? It's got some of that stored energy in, in compression, right? So there's a huge amount of, of energy that was chemical energy of like reactions, of burning. So all of that took a lot of energy away from the kinetics and into other forms of energy, okay? So 
And then if we want to find the fraction of energy loss, it will look like this. Okay, and then we'll plug everything in, cancel out the velocities to find that it is also independent. And this one takes a little bit of algebra here, algebra here but it finds out, we find out that it's also independent of the initial velocity of the bullet. Um, of course, independent of the final velocity of the block. And, and then it's going to be 0 0.995. But the, re the reason I kind of rushed to the algebra here is we could actually reason this out. Because if this is the fraction of kinetic energy that was remaining, then the fraction of kinetic energy that's lost just has to be the, the complement of that. right? It's, they have to sum to 1. All right, so if you've got half, half of 1% or 0 0.005 ratio, then the amount that's lost is 0.995. Or in other words, 99.5% of the energy of the bullet is lost. Okay? And lost, I should say, changing forms from mechanical systems. But that means that afterwards, the mechanical energy is tiny. Okay? Which is why, the, you know, of course, the block is only moving at 2.41 meters per second, which is sure a lot smaller than 450. And that's, that's because of the dramatic difference in their masses. If the bullet was just a little bit bigger, these numbers wouldn't be so dramatic. Or if the block was smaller, they wouldn't be so dramatic. It really matters, right? And it's only dependent on that ratio of masses. All right, so pretty cool. All right, so moving right along, now we're going to finally look at examples that involve collisions and energy. All right, and that's, that's going to be the rest, the rest of this lecture. All right, so here we have a system where something's going to slide down, smash together, and then slide back up. All right, the idea is that when they smash together, when the two blocks stick together, they're going to stick together in a perfectly inelastic way, which means they're going to travel as one afterwards. All right, so here we're going to have three energy states, one, two, and three. All right, and then this is, the, this is what ha is ha happening during the collision. We have block one, which is just um, moving at some velocity. It strikes the other block, and they stick together, now with twice the mass, because they're equal mass blocks, and they travel with some velocity after the collision. So A just represents before the collision, B is after the collision, and then not, our third velocity, is the velocity that starts the whole thing. All right? There's no velocity at 3 because we're trying to look for the, the stuck together blocks to slide up the 3, make it all the way to the top, but then not be moving when they make it there. All right? And the whole question here is how fast do we have to push this block in order for that to happen? Okay? So we're going to work backwards from the final potential energy. All right? So we want the final potential energy at 0.3. So then comparing energy 3 to energy 2, we know that in the final state, we're going to have m total times gravity times r, because at the when it gets to 3, it's going to be all potential energy rel relative to some point y equals 0. And up here is y equals r. right? So it just it like went up to a higher point but came to rest. And then at 2, it was all kinetic energy, because that's a, that's a zero state of potential. All right? And so then when we solve for that symbolically, we, then we find that the velocity b, that's the velocity after the collision, must be root 2 gr. All right, because R here is kind of playing the role of height because it's, you know, up at the top of the ramp. Okay, so during the perfectly inelastic collision shown, shown right there, we know that we need the final velocity equal to that. So then we're going to set up our conservation of momentum uh, equation. We definitely don't want a conservation of energy equation because this is a perfectly inelastic collision where energy is not conserved. We just saw that, right? Energy can be dramatically not conserved. Okay, and so then, but anyway, we're just going to plug in what we know. All right, we'll plug in VB in the, pro in the form that we know it has to be coming from energy. So that's all I've done here is just substitute. Um, well, first thing I do is I just kind of start solving for VA. All right, I say, oh, well, if I'm just going to divide both sides by M, M plus M is just 2M, divide both sides by M. Well, the M's cancel. And then rewrite uh, VB in terms of what I know it must be in terms of the square root of 2GR from conservation of energy. All right, and move on to step three. So finally, the energy conservation that started the whole process. Okay, so again, I'm working, I work, I'm working backwards from 3 to 2 and now from 2 to 1. Okay, so what does energy look like conserved from 1 to 2? All right, well, it's just, there should be a 1 right there. It should be, well, initially, it's, there's some kinetic energy, and I'm not, this, is my fine, this is what I'm trying to solve for, by the way, is V0. All right, there was also some potential energy, MGR, and then there's going to be some kinetic energy right before the collision, that 1 half MVA squared. Okay, for, for the collision, the only block that was in motion was this one before they, they crashed together and stuck together. All right, and so then I'll plug in. All right, so I got my one half um, v naught squared, and then I'm going to rewrite um, the v a squared in, um, in what I know it must be from both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. I know it's going to have the form of two root two g r. I'm going to be squaring that. All right, it's going to have a one half in front of it because I'm substituting it into a kinetic energy. All right. Um, furthermore, I'm going to have my minus g r. All right, because the minus gr is just this term here that I've subtracted from both sides of the equation. And so when it ends up on the right side of the equation, it's a minus. All right, and I'm going to clean this up a bit. 
All right, so when I clean it up, I, I remember to square this, then I end up with 4GR, that's this, this term right here, and the GR is, is still just there, okay? And now I'm just gonna isolate my V naught. All right, so let's do that. Oh, forgot it was next line down. So anyway, so then I, I multiplied both sides by two because 4GR minus GR is three, multiply by two and I get six, and then take the square root, and I find that the initial velocity is root six GR. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? And then plug in my numbers, 9.8 for gravity, 1.42 for the radius, and that gives me a velocity of 9.14. So in other words, I, had, I would have had to push this block with a velocity of 9.14 tangent to the, the, the ramp here, right, or tangent to the, the indentation, so that when, by the time it crashed into the second block and then they slid up together, they made it all the way to the top. Because if I just released it, they wouldn't make it all the way to the top, all right? But if I give it a nice push, they will. Okay, so you have to give some extra energy. Why do you have to give extra energy? Because energy was lost during the perfectly inelastic collision. Okay, cool, right? All right, moving right along. Got a couple more. Another one that involves a collision conservation of energy. This one also involves a perfectly inelastic collision. They're going to stick together afterwards. So it's a very similar idea. Um, now there's a spring, so there's other forms of potential energy and there's some friction. So basically it's a lot like example five, just adding a few elements in terms of energy and just to you know, kind of um, add one final um, element, there's also projectile motion. What projectile motion means is we have to um, use the equations of projectile motion in order to find range. Because if one thing you remember, you can't find range with just energy. You have to actually you know, find the time of flight. In other words, consider, consider, consider gravitational acceleration. All right, so it's kind of cool. There's a lot, a lot of things to, to piece together here but they all fit together pretty nicely, right? So I'm just gonna run through it at a good clip here. So conservation of energy from one to two. This is this initial compression of the spring. This is showing the final projectile motion. And this would be the projectile motion of, the, of M1 and M2. Once they fuse together, they get stuck together as one object and they travel through there as one. All right, so first of all, find the velocity before the collision using conservation of energy. What does that look like? Well, that's this E1 equals E2, which is some potential energy of the spring. We're actually given it um, in joules rather than the compression. So we could find X, but we, we weren't given it. All right. Um, and I, yeah, well, actually, we weren't given the spring constant. So we, yeah, so we're, we're fine though. All right. And then we've got the, we don't need it. And then this is just the energy loss to friction. This is, this would be uh, WF, by the way, this express, this, that term right there. And this is the final kinetic energy right before the collision. All right. And so then we can go ahead and solve for that. The energy right, or the velocity right before the collision, plug in our own numbers. And I decided not to keep it symbolic because it gets, get, gets so clunky. So that, there it is, that's the velocity of M1 right before the collision, okay? And it's A because it, it's A comes first, okay? And now let's go to the second step. All right, second step, find the velocity after the perfectly inelastic collision. So we use conservation of energy. Now we're gonna use conservation of momentum for the collision itself, all right? So there you see it. It's a, a perfectly inelastic collision, so momentum conservation is pretty simple, right? Because only one of them is at motion, one is at rest. So, you know, it's really, really, you know, simplifies nicely. All right, and then we're just gonna solve for that final velocity. This is the velocity of M1 and M2. All right, and when we do that, we find that it's uh, 0.848, because quite a bit of energy is lost um, in any inelastic collision. So that's what we see here. And then finally, they're gonna become airborne. So then we're gonna find the range with projectile motion. All right, which means we need to find the time of flight. All right, kind of going through this, because we've seen this before. Time of flight is 3.75. That's based on the height of the table, which we were given. And then finally, we plug that in, plug in V naught X, which is gonna be this number here, time the times the time of flight, and there we find that it travels 3.18 meters. That's it, all right, cool. All right, let's do, let's do it again, but let's do it for a elastic collision. Okay, so this is, this is one where they don't stick together. So that makes, complicates matters a little bit. This one's also a spring, so what's going on here? So we're gonna have two objects crash together, we're gonna have a collision, but they're going to not stick together, all right? So in this case, um, I think this one is, yeah, this is, this is an elastic collision, no loss of energy during the collision, okay? And we don't know the final velocity of A or the final velocity of B, but we do know some things about the energy of B because we know that it's, it's attached to a spring, that it's traveling in a certain velocity, and that the spring is extended, and we know the spring constant of the spring, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're going to use conservation of momentum um, momentum and energy during the collision, right? Why energy during the collision? Because it's elastic. That's the only time we use energy during the collision. Furthermore, we're gonna use conservation of mechanical energy during the spring compression, because what we're finally gonna solve for is the maximum compression of the spring, okay? 
and we were told that when uh, when this collision happened, it happened really quickly, so it didn't. So, and that's the thing, right? If you consider a collision with an object that is attached to a spring, you might be like, well, isn't the spring compressing during the collision itself? No, the collisions are so fast that the spring doesn't have time to compress. It only compresses after the collision is done, okay? Because that, that's our necessary condition for no external forces and using these equations in the first place. But anyway, the, the, the spring was extended to begin with. It was at, out a distance of XB, all right, away from its equilibrium, which is just the rest length of the spring. Okay, so let's go ahead and find out. So we assume that the collision happens instantaneously, as I said. All right, so we're going to use, um, for part one, we're going to actually use our, our um, derived equation for final velocity, since it is elastic, all right, which is nice. So we don't have to, you know, drive it ourselves. All right, and then we're going to use that, that form of, uh, of energy, or just, I'm just saying this is where it comes from. All right, so this, this equation comes from there. Okay, again, you don't have to drive it. All right, plug in the numbers. So, all right, and we get 10.3. Okay, so this is the final velocity of B after the collision. Remember that it was moving um, at a velocity of 2.5. It was moving to the right, which means that it would, the spring had obviously been more compressed and then it was coming back, right? It was moving, it was moving in the positive x direction, which means that it's moving even faster in the positive x direction after the collision. Okay, and actually, I, uh, um, this, I realized that I show it here is moving in, um, towards A. It's actually actually moving away from A at the moment they collide. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, and now, um, but you know, A, it's, A still going to catch up with it because A is way faster. But anyway, so now we use VB prime in conservation of mechanical energy. All right. So then we're just going to have some, uh, some velocity. We know that there actually is elastic energy to start with. And then there's going to be even greater elastic energy to end with. And that's what we're going to solve for X final. That's just the final compression of the spring, which is going to be a lot greater than, um, than 4.3. And we plug in the numbers and it ends up being, drum roll, 1.47 meters. Why so giant, right? I mean, everything else was in centimeters. Well, because that's a lot of extra energy that was, that was imparted to the block. So it gets compressed a lot. Now, I don't know if the spring is long enough to handle 1.47 meters of compression, but that's what it would have to in order to not break, okay? All right, so that's, that's the idea. That's a, this, this one involves an elastic one, which means we had a different equation to use and has some energy fo um, considerations following the collision, okay? All right, final, final one here, okay? This, is, this one's pretty cool. This is the idea of dropping a baseball and basketball together so they kind of hit the ground simultaneously and that causes the baseball to fly up way higher than the height you dropped it from, all right? So how's that possible? Well, let's run through it. All right, so um, it's possible because the basketball is a much more massive than the baseball, all right, honestly, but how does it work? All right, so we're gonna do kinematics during the free fall, conservation uh, of uh, momentum during the collision, and that's gonna happen when, um, so the idea is that the, when they collide, the basketball is already on the way back up because they hit the ground a moment before, and the, but the baseball is still moving down. That's the key idea, is the collision occurs when the basketball has already hit the ground and is just starting to come back up, Meanwhile, the baseball is still going down, all right? So even though you think you kind of drop them together, when they actually collide, they're moving in opposite directions, okay? And then finally, conservation of energy after the collision to find the, total, the final height of the baseball, okay? So let's plug in our numbers. Oh, maximum height, yep, okay? So when you do kinematics to find how fast they're going, we could have used energy as well. We find out um, that they're going at a magnitude of 2 GY based on their release height. And that means that the mat, um, that means that the basketball would have a velocity, and this you know including direction of positive two gy. Meanwhile, the baseball of mass little m would have a velocity of negative root two gy. All right, why is that? Because as I said, the ba the baseball is still moving down at the moment they collide, whereas the basketball is already on its way back up, and that's key for making the baseball go way high. All right. And then we're going to use conservation of, moment, of uh, momentum and energy during the collision because it is elastic. All right, so that this is this is what the equations look like. All right, and then um, I'm just going to go ahead instead of even using these algebraically, I'm just going to go ahead to our prefabricated formulas that I love to use for any elastic uh, collisions. Okay, all right, and plug you know plug in the values. Okay, so for um, B, all right, um, then we're going to just plug in. All right, and this is going to, um, we know we want the final velocity of B to be zero. Here, B is representing big M or the basketball. The reason that we want it to be zero is because, I kind of skipped over the problem, but it says if the large ball rebounds elastically from the floor and then the small ball rebounds elastically from the large ball, what value of M results in the large ball stopping when it collides with the smaller ball? All right, 
So that's the thing. Was we, and we know that the, um, the um, basketball has a mass of 630 grams or 0.63 kilograms. So how big does the baseball have to be, little m, in order for the, the basketball to come to rest? So the basketball just would just basically just stay on the ground. You'd see it kind of just quickly like do a real quick bounce, like, you know, kind of jiggle and just stop, just stay there. Meanwhile, the baseball is going to go flying up to a much higher height than it started from because this cool idea, right? All right. So anyway, um, so that we know we want it to be zero and that allows us to solve for little m. So if I solve for little m, all right, then we get a result that it has to be one third the mass of big M. So nice, elegant result, which would be tw um, tw 210 grams or 0.21 kilograms. Okay. And we're going to then carry that into part B and part B we're asked, what height does the small ball reach the baseball? All right. So then I'm going to plug, plug that number back in to find the final velocity after the collision. All right, so this is just the final, so this is Vm prime using conservation and momentum, basically using this equation right here, okay? And, and, I, and I can use it now because I know exactly what ma or little m is. It's one third of big M, which allows for a nice cancellation of everything. All right, and then see, so then we just get all the fractions because it's, it's completely independent of kilograms at this point. It's just a, a coefficient, all right? And then plug it all in. We're now we're just solving for the final velocity of m after the collision. All right, and then... And then we're going to use conservation of energy. That's what this is right here. So this is just the uh, kinetic energy, and this is the potential energy. I didn't label them. Excuse, please, you know, let me apologize for that. But this is this is kinetic energy immediately after the collision, and this is final potential energy once that baseball reaches maximum height. Try, I'm try, kind of trying to squeeze it in bottom of the page. So there's our h final, the final final height of the baseball, and it's four times its release height. All right, which would be 7.2 meters because we were told that they were released from 1.8 meters. So that, that's what's so cool about this, why it's such a neat demo, is you know, I could, I could drop this baseball, basketball together from like, you know, the height of my shoulder, you know, 1.8 meters or something, have it, have it come down, more like you know, from my head height, have it come down, hit the ground, and all of a sudden the baseball goes flying up four times higher than me. It just, it kind of seems like energy just came out of nowhere, right? It's, this is, uh, sometimes this is, this is refer referred to as a gravitational slingshot because it's like, wait, where did that extra energy come from? It came from the fact that, that the baseball stole, stole energy from the basketball, which is why the basketball just laid on the ground, all right? And here we actually had a maximum theft of energy from, um, of, you know, on the part of the baseball from the basketball because we, we balanced the masses just right, which is what we found in part A. So pretty cool, right? Okay, well, finally, this wraps up all these different types of collisions considering conservation of energy for all of them. Um, I hope it's been interesting. I hope this has really shown you all the different types of examples you can see and how you can approach solving these types of problems. Thank you so, for, so much for watching this lecture video.